Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our series on the English Civil War and its effect on the colonies. Today, the English Civil War arrives at the colonies, and we'll have a look at that. By 1644, which is where we start today's episode, it is clear that there are two sides in England. One side is known as the Royalists, those loyal to King Charles I, and the other side, uh, which is the Parliamentarian group. And in January of 1644, the Royalists actually form their own parliament known as the Oxford Parliament. And it operates beside what we know as the Long Parliament, and that's the group of Roundheads or Puritans who are, at the time, running the country, fighting with King Charles I. The Oxford Parliament was not very effective as many of its members wanted a negotiated peace and actually defected as the tide of the war turned. The other side of the English Civil War, as I said earlier, was occupied by the parliamentarians, and they supported legislative and legal authority of Parliament over England. During all this madness, England receives a visitor, and it's none other than Roger Williams, and I have to kind of laugh at that if you've been listening to the podcast for a while now. Roger Williams comes from Rhode Island to England in the middle of a civil war because he wants to receive formal patent recognition for his colony. And I tell you, he's just, he's a man that I guess I would call in the wrong place at the wrong time. He got banished from Massachusetts Bay in the middle of winter. He sat in the Narragansett uh, colony or Narragansett tribe, I should say, of natives while they're trying to broker not going to war with the colonists. So Roger Williams is uh, no good soldier for timing. So Roger Williams is in England, and his goal was to unite Providence, Portsmouth, and Newport into a single colony. He was opposed at home by William Coddington, who founded Portsmouth in 1638, and Newport in 1639, when Portsmouth colonists ejected him from their colony over his authoritarian state and church views. Coddington used his power at Newport to consolidate the two towns with him as governor. To make matters worse for Roger Williams, the New England Confederation that we talked about last week, the United Colonies of New England, was claiming land closer and closer to Rhode Island, so now they're creeping in. Roger Williams needed a patent or he was going to find himself a, a subject in his own home. And to who, we have no idea yet. William's patent is granted on March 13th, 1644. One must wonder how Roger Williams was able to convince King Charles I to grant this patent amongst everything that's going on and what Roger Williams represents. Well, in fact... King Charles did not grant that patent. The patent was actually granted by the parliamentarians, as indicated in the first paragraph of its document. Many notable names are mentioned as consenting authorities, including Viscount Say, Henry Vane, who was the former governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and Oliver Cromwell. The original name of the colony was the Providence Plantations. Roger Williams is named its first governor, and leaders following Williams would use the title president. Using that title president really, to me, speaks of identifying yourselves as much more autonomous than other colonies. Meanwhile, tragedy was striking the Virginia colony. On April 18, 1644, natives under the leadership of Ope Takenau, that's right, he's still alive, 
killed nearly 400 colonists in what was called the Great Massacre. It was a repeat event of what happened in Jamestown 22 years earlier. But this time, natives targeted the remote outreaches where the colonists had extended themselves into. Those who are bound not to learn from history, they will repeat it. And in the case of some of these Jamestown colonists, they did. The House of Burgesses met on June 3rd, 1644, and they passed a motion. Let's have a look at the writing. It is therefore ordered by this present Grand Assembly that the governor be entreated to repair for England and implore his majesty gracious assistance for our relief. Oh no, I'm not sure if William Berkeley, who's the governor there at the time, understands what's going on in England, but if he doesn't and he pulls into London, he's going to see that there is no royal presence there. Remember, King Charles fled London uh, in our previous episode. It is totally under Puritan control. The House of Burgesses also requested that merchants trade with the Dutch and the Swedes. So now they're opening trade up pretty much for everybody. And they also implored New England for help, which is interesting. So William Berkeley goes over to England, finds it in the middle of a civil war, and Berkeley ends up trying to help the king and the royalists retain power before returning to Virginia empty-handed in 1645. I think it's one of those cases where William Berkeley shows up and finds that his allies are in greater trouble than he is. So he could not uh, do anything about the situation there in England. He ends up coming back. The Virginia colonists go to war with Ope Tackenau. In the Massachusetts Bay, a Virginian merchant found John Winthrop unwilling to help the Virginian cause against the native. And Winthrop actually writes about this. Let's have a look. It was very observable that this massacre came upon them soon after they had driven out the godly ministers we had sent to them, and had made an order that all such as would not conform to the discipline of the Church of England should depart the country by a certain day, which the massacre now prevented. Very interesting here. John Winthrop pointing to religion as the cause for what's going on, and also pointing to Virginia's uh, removal of their ministers, the Massachusetts Bay Puritan ministers, as reason not to help them. So in 1645, the North-South Division, as we see in America, centered around religion. The North favored the Puritans and the Parliamentarians, while the South favored the King, the Church of England, and in the case of Maryland, Catholicism. In Maryland, a captain arriving at St. Mary's in 1645 is arrested for insulting the king, which you figure would happen. He's arrested by Deputy Governor Giles Brent. The captain would escape with the aid of Captain Thomas Cornwallis an act that would get Cornwallis expelled from the colony. So there's some division going on within Maryland. But back to the Massachusetts Bay. The colony just elected John Endicott as its 10th governor. And for those of you who have been with us a while, that name should sound familiar because it was the same Endicott that served as the colony's first governor. As the colony was struggling with the uh, Articles of Confederation, long story short, the laws in the Articles of Confederation that said you had to supply a resource clashed with the practices of the Massachusetts Bay General Court, which had to review and approve such measures. And it's actually equatable to the European Union and the struggles that they have today. Essentially, there is this 
political authority somewhat aligning, but the fiscal responsibility of the colony remains there at home, and the general court still has to approve all fiscal measures. So there was a little bit of a disconnect there. The issue of the English Civil War comes up in 1644, where the Massachusetts Bay believes it needs to take a side. Let's look at what John Winthrop has to say about that. If we who have so openly declared our affection to the cause of the Parliament by our prayers, fastings, etc., should now oppose their authority or do anything that might make such an appearance, it would be laid hold on by those in Virginia and the West Indies to conform them in their rebellious course, and it would grieve all our godly friends in England or any other of the Parliament's friends. So Winthrop's saying we better take a side. This would be complicated further when a boat loyal to Parliament attacks a boat loyal to the King in the Massachusetts Bay. So now the fighting is right there in Boston. Despite being allied with the parliamentarians, the government did not take too kindly to that boat of parliamentarians and their actions. When they were refused entry aboard the captured ship, they fired a warning shot from a cannon on shore. So basically, the Massachusetts Bay colonists are saying, we want to, we want to board this captured ship captured by the parliamentarians. Parliamentarians refuse, and a warning shot is fired from the shore. Let's see what else John Winthrop has to say about this. Then we sent 40 men armed aboard the Dartmouth ship, and upon that Captain Richardson came ashore and acknowledged his error and his sorrow for what he had done, yet with all alleging some reasons for his excuse. So it's kind of like that, I'm sorry, but I had a reason for doing this type deal. And for the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it likely meant that trade was taking precedent to them. If ships start firing on each other right outside your shores, that's going to impact your trade relationships. And their economy was very sensitive to trade at this time. As the calendar changed over to the year 1645, things deteriorated further in England. The Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the principal leader of the Church of England, basically like the Pope, is executed in January 1645. In Maryland, the English Civil War lands right on its shores when Captain Ingle, the same captain who was arrested for speaking ill of the king, arrives in St. Mary's and forcefully seizes the city. So now Maryland is not under the control of the Leonard Calverts or the Catholics. Leonard Calvert ends up fleeing and finding safe haven in, of all places, Virginia. And if you followed this podcast for a while, Maryland and Virginia are not friends. While ill feelings may have still existed between the two colonies, the war with the natives preoccupied the Virginians over this reaction to Leonard Calvert's residency there. Not much exists in the formal record about the transition of power, forcefully, from Leonard Calvert to this Captain Engel in Maryland. But the Committee for the Foreign Plantations, which is controlled by the English Parliament, recognized the Protestant government in Maryland. So they recognized Captain Engel. In New England, the Narragansett renewed their war with the Uncas and threatened war with the United Colonies. Roger Williams, who is back in Rhode Island, once again is caught in the middle of a mess, and he actually warns Massachusetts Bay that war is imminent. 
The United Colonies raises a 300-man standing army in preparation for war. The Narragansett opt not to fight a war and instead come to Boston to negotiate a peace where they would pay a tribute or a fee to the United Colonies. John Winthrop notes in his writings that indentured servant traffic from England to New England had slowed because of the Civil War. Winthrop also noted that money was very scarce. We saw this in last week's episode too. So payments made to servants whose tenure had ended were difficult to make. Each colony has been affected differently by all this. Maryland, clearly, under the command of somebody else. Puritan Massachusetts Bay having economic problems. And Virginia is dealing with native uh, wars and threats. But it's clear with the different uh, things going on that the English Civil War had now spilled into the colonies. Next week on Historical Context, we'll continue right along and see how the colonies react to all of these changes. Next time on Historical Context. <laughs>